Showcasing local talent, professionals, and everyday people making Salt Lake City what it is today. It's time for another episode of the I Am Salt Lake podcast. How's everybody doing out there? Thank you so much for checking out a brand new episode of the I Am Salt Lake podcast. This is episode 176. My name is Chris Hollifield. I am your host. Welcome to my show. Thank you so much for listening. However you got here, however you're consuming it, however you're listening. I've got a great episode. Paul Dwayne, he joins me. We sit down, we chat, we have a great conversation. We find out his story, find out how he got involved with radio, how he got involved in photography. His story, I mean, it's a it's a great story. We even we even chat about Burning Man, his experience at Burning Man a few years ago. I'm going to be playing that conversation here in just a minute. I want to tell you guys about City Home Collective. They are good friends of ours. I want to thank them for letting us use their spot to record this episode as well as many other episodes of the I Am Salt Lake podcast. Uh, their website, you can find it at cityhomecollective.com. You can find them on Facebook. Make sure to uh, support these guys. Give them some love. If you're in the market to uh, sell a home, buy a home, check out their website and get in touch, uh, as well as there's many other great resources for Salt Lake City on their website as well. Uh, the website for the podcast is IamSaltLake.com. It's where you can go and uh, find out more about myself, find out more about the podcast, as well as dig through that entire back catalog right there on the website. Like I mentioned, Paul Dwayne is on this episode of the podcast. Ryan Prince sits down and uh, joins me and co-hosts this episode. And uh, so I'm going to quit talking. So why don't you guys join us as we talk to Paul Dwayne at City Home Collective in beautiful downtown Salt Lake City, Utah. We don't know you as well as we'd like to. That's why we brought you on Perfect. the show. Well, thanks, so, guys. I've been, I've been creeping you online, man. Excellent. Creep the website. Listen to some shows. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. good. You guys got heckled on that uh, show for not being funny anymore. Oh, God. I was like, <laughs> I was like what are you talking about? <laughs> that guy's such a fucker. <laughs> that guy. I've got this listener that I swear I've never met this guy in person, but he... It's like he can see right through my soul, through the radio waves, and every now and then he'll call in and just call me out on on shit that I don't want anybody knowing about, and namely my insecurities. You know, like everything else, fine. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not. Is that. he just just nuanced? He just gets just you really what? nuanced stuff. Like yeah. one day he called and he's like, "You're being measured and you're holding back. You're not being yourself, and blah, that sucks." And I and and it was in one of those moments where I totally was because I was dealing with some insecurities and just like, "Oh, I'm not good enough at being a radio show host," and blah blah blah. And he calls in and calls me out and on it in front of everybody mercilessly and wants to go on about ten minutes for it. <laughs> it sucked. <laughs> And this guy, that's the same guy that called in. Yeah. Like, you guys aren't that funny right now. I'm like, oh, he called out the whole staff. I was he, like, he calls, <laughs> he's like, you're being, you're so dark lately. What's your deal? You know, I'm like, I don't some know. days it's just not on. Dude, I don't know. Hey, I feel like it's on. Yeah. It's just dark on, like in this room. This, yeah. Speaking of that, yeah. we're back at City Home Collective, you guys. Absolutely. Downstairs. City Home Collective. Have you been here before, Paul? No, sir. It's really? Beautiful. For some reason, I pictured you as, uh, the party animal here, you know. Not yet. Not yet. Maybe well, welcome to the City Home forth. Collective. Yeah. This is their uh, members lounge. Oh. We've been doing a handful of recordings here. It's beautiful. Lately. Thank you to uh, Cody Derrick and the rest of the City Home Collective uh, what's up, team. What's up, Cody? Yeah, what's up, Cody? If you're listening, thank what's you up, so Lauren? much. Uh, Thanks for, for supporting us. For lis- or, yeah, for listening, support, and the whole nine yards. We have Paul DeWayne on the show today. We're going to get to uh, meet him and find out what he's all about and but who's Paul Dwayne? You know, oh, more or less. By the end of this, I want to be in your soul, man. Let's oh. let's let's hear the real the oh, real boy. stuff here. All right, all right. Where where should we start? <laughs> I kind of want to go back real far, if that's possible. Kind of what led you up to where you're at? Because I know you have a heck of a story. I mean, well, we could be here for a while. I think if uh, we're not careful. One uh, one you know charming afternoon in probably uh, November, my parents had their honeymoon and. You know, uh, that's how it all began, I guess. Dude, you were a honeymoon baby? No, no, it wasn't. Hun- no, they got married in September. Oh, God, mom and dad. Are but it was close? Did they cut it close? No, I think it was in September. So so they they definitely were a no. Uh, they're getting right on it because I came a few months later. I mean, a few a year later. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> a few months later. <laughs> maybe that means my dad came a few months later. I don't know. Sorry. Sounds like your so dad were you was, born here in Utah? My dad will then? never hear this. Yeah. Right here in Salt Lake or where were you uh, born? In Logan. Logan, Logan. Utah. Yeah. 
And Strong. How long did you stay up in Logan for? Uh, man, I was born and raised up there, and um, I was such. I have such a typical Utah Mormon story. Let's born and raised in Logan, went to high school up there, met you know. Uh, I ended up marrying my my high school sweetheart. You know, I went on a mission to Philadelphia, and that was you know I so that was a good time. But otherwise, I came home from my mission. We got married and uh, started a family right off the bat. And so I haven't really had time to live anywhere else. And <laughs> since then, I've sunk some created developed some roots here in Salt Lake. I mean, there was a time when I was thinking like, ah, I'm going to get the hell out of here. This is, you know, there are pro- probably bigger, better things for me in another city with a more of an art district because I, I, I've made my career in photography for the past 12 years. And, uh, so for the longest time I thought I'd eventually get out of here because of that. But then through a very strange chain of events, I ended up getting into, um, what I'm doing now, doing the show and into, um, broadcasting and and uh i don't really want to call it entertainment because i don't think it's that entertaining and for people but, listening that might not be familiar with your show it's on oh, right, k-talk right. radio yeah. right yeah i've got i've got a show it's just a very original name it's called the paul dewayne show and named uh, after yourself I'm, named after I'm, myself because i couldn't think of anything else to name it <laughs> that didn't sound super shitty this is the least shitty name i could think of for the show you know i've got some roots here in town when i took up the radio show two years ago i kind of made a decision like okay I'm going to stay here for a while. I've got some I've got some work to do and kind of identified with that idea of grow where you're planted and so yeah. So you you married your high school sweetheart? Yeah. How long were you married for? 7 years. 7 years. That itch yeah. just got just Oh man, I wish really it was that exciting scratchy, a story. Huh? No. Yeah, it's not. You know, it was pretty boring. You have you have kids? Yeah, two daughters. They're uh, 13 and 15. So So, so you parted ways. With the, with the high school sweetheart. Mm-hmm. You ventured then to Salt Lake City, or at what point did you make your way down to Salt Lake City? Yeah, from after our divorce back in, um, 2005. Yeah, 2005. Um, it's been 10 years. I've outlived the statistics, gentlemen. <laughs> the statistics of? <laughs> that most men remarry within two years of their divorce. Well, uh, I, I outlived yeah. it as two, well, two too. Three years. Yeah. Hey, you guys. How, cheers. I, cheers. I outlived it myself. Cheers to, to being yeah. the statistics. I've been, gentlemen, I've, I've been successfully right. single for. <laughs> Almost five years. Well done, sir. Well Thank done. you. Why do you Thank think you. that is? Why do you think men, men just run out and, and get remarried? Pussy. They can't. They can't live alone, or they can't. They need someone to take have care. No, of No, are you no, kidding? No. You've already Look. given away all of your like ability to like control all the stuff that Look. you don't want to do. You know, you have to get back in the game, try I mean, and do your own laundry. Are you kidding you me? You got to keep in mind: for every man that's getting married after two to three years, there's a woman getting married to him. So it's not just a man thing. Yeah, you know, I I, I think people, I think. The reason for that statistic, and also correspondingly the reason for the statistic that most of those marriages fail, like 80% of those fail, is that people get into relationships for terrible reasons. You know, people are not self-aware. People get into relationships. A lot of times people get into a relationship when really they should probably just get a dog or a goldfish instead. You know, or go on like a vacation in South America or Europe or like just or, do something or maybe just self defining. Like start visiting Vegas, you know, every yeah. month or so and just hire a prostitute, you know, just and, and I say that sort of jokingly, but sort of totally not at all. Especially not, around here, gotta say, if you if 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 you back off like the dogma and give yourself like room to breathe and be like, Hey, I'm a mammal, I'm gonna be myself for a minute. Well, you I can, mean sex aside, you know, we, we are social animals. And, and we do crave connection. It's in our DNA. You know, we, we are, we are pack animals and it will probably be thousands of years before we really evolve out of that because that's what our DNA contains right now. And we're so dependent on, on the tribe just from a, an emotional slash DNA level. Um, it, it, I mean, it's not, it's not surprising that, uh, that people remarry so quickly. And I, I think that they have good intentions, but, um, most people are really poorly equipped to be in a healthy relationship. I want to jump into. You were a postman. Oh you yeah, worked for the post office. Yeah, I did a little research on. It. I did a little <laughs> nice. bit of uh, studying up on, because I find that so fascinating that you're at where you're at today, but you were a postman, right? Which has actually been uh, like kind of this weird dream job as a young kid, because I always thought their uniforms were awesome, and, <laughs> you know, the hats and the satchels and everything, and the shorts and the shorts. You can't beat the, the shorts. shorts. When did you become a postman? All right, so the postman That's thing. That's Tori. I, I got to hear this. Well, and it's actually pretty essential to what's going on in my life right now. Okay. Um, several years ago, I, I had um, been involved in a business venture that was going to be brilliant and crash and burn at the last minute and lost shitloads of money and time and opportunity cost, and I just I needed something. And so I, I took a job working for the Postal Service thinking like, hey, this is just going to be uh, 
two or three months. I'm just going to collect a couple paychecks and get off on my feet, take care of a few messes and get on with my life and get back to photography full time, you know? So I, I took this job as a letter carrier and, um, the problem with that job is that they worked us so much and they paid us so well that it was really what I thought was going to be a two or three month gig turned into four years. And I mean, you wouldn't believe how much letter carriers get paid. Just guess. What do you think? 15 bucks an hour. Mm. Oh, go up. I was going well, go, to go, I was going to go, but in my head, that's what I thought. Yeah. I was going to go on a yearly basis, maybe yeah, like 48 grand. Oh, way, way more. Really? 70 grand up. What? 90 grand? Like I, I made between 65 and 70 when I was a here in Salt carrier. Lake. Yeah. Just a, a, a beginning postal service carrier. Yeah. Like some of those guys are making 80, 90, you know, between, and they have the most cushy benefits in the world. It's, it's in some ways, look, if you don't know what you want to do with your life and you just need, you know, you want to make a paycheck and come home and watch football at night, be a letter carrier, man, for sure. <laughs> but dude, you guys good to know. I, go I, I, dude, my, <laughs> my guy in holiday is a stud, man. Yeah. The, I've I invited mean, him and his daughter over. They swam for a little bit yeah, there's in some the cool, summer. There's some cool. Great cool dude. There, yeah. But so the letter carrier thing, I, I, that was totally unintentional to stay in it that long. But you know, when you work a job, 70 hours a week, you're there six days a week and you're getting paid that well, you barely have any time to think about anything other than just recouping for the next day, you know? And so I was still doing photography at night. I was sleeping no more than four hours a night between two to four hours a night, Dude. seven days a week for four years. Meth is a powerful drug. It's amazing, man. I've I'm never just touched kidding. it. I don't know how you do that. I got to uh, have like a seven, I, I eight hours. It, just on, it was just like sh- lots of sugar and willpower. Sugar will do it. Yeah. So you're, you're single at this point. Yeah, yeah. Single. So you're single. Yep. You're carrying the mail. A postman. Mm-hmm. And you're so doing your passion projects. Photography and just- at night. I had a small studio in my place, a small photo studio, and uh, doing a lot of event photography. But I, the only way I kept my sanity during this job was to um, listen to audiobooks and podcasts and things. Nice. And I got turned on to some libertarian stuff. And this is I, I did I carried the mail between 2008 and 2012, which were sandwiched between two very important elections, the two years that Ron Paul ran for president. And I became really, really interested in what he was doing. A good friend of mine turned me on to some some libertarian oriented podcasts, and I hadn't I wasn't really familiar with the whole libertarian idea, but I became really intrigued with it because these guys were speaking common sense in a way that you rarely hear in political discourse. I was super intrigued by it. So you combine that with I was also listening to a lot of comedy at the time. Uh, Mark Marin, Adam Carolla, Joe Rogan, some of these great comedic podcasters. And well, back then there wasn't a lot probably to even pick from, though. I mean, there were some, but, yeah. but those are those guys were the standard then, and I think they still are today. Yeah, you know. And um, anyway, you can only listen to guys like that for so long before they be kind of kind of become your heroes, and before you decide I need to try this out too. So finally, there came a time when I just thought, shit, I've got to try this stand up thing, and and um, I didn't tell anybody about it. It was my deep. It was my secret. I mean, how preposterous is that to say I'm going to get on stage and make people laugh because huh? I think I'm a funny guy? You know, like that's. that's sh- I think that's just so fucking stupid. And so I didn't tell anybody, and I would just go to the comedy clubs by myself and sit in the back and listen and watch how it all went down and kind of learn the flow of the club and the kind of the etiquette of an open mic night. And then finally, I got at the balls to start writing some stuff and went up and tried it out and. It was mildly painful. Um, <laughs> couple nice, dude. I'm proud of you, man. This but, is an awesome story. But you know, not enough to keep me from doing it again and again. I kept doing it, and ha- you know, stand-up comedy has made me has hurt my soul and searched my soul more than anything. Almost, it's up there with my divorce. Like it was that. <laughs> it was that like, painful. It's there are times you get off stage from doing stand-up comedy, you know, and you just think. Just like, why the fuck do I do this to myself? <laughs> I must, I must hate myself at a primal, deep, sub, sub, sub. You just need a level. soul scrubbing tonight. I just, just fucking hate myself. It's obvious. Look, they all hate me. I, why do I keep doing this? You know, like, and but on the other hand, though, when you get up there and you drop a couple jokes and people are connecting with you and laughing, it's like getting your dick sucked by seventy people at the same time. There's nothing like it in the world. There's not a drug. Jihads like start it. to make sense. Everything just comes clean. <laughs> Let's see what is I mean, Monday. I'm going to do stand up on Wednesday. If it makes you feel that good, right? Cat, get get cat to uh, keep you away from uh, tall buildings and tr- and railroad tracks because I you know it may go well, it may not. There's no way to know. Um, but anyway, the stand up thing. So I started doing that. And a buddy of mine, we would go and do these stand-up comedy nights, and we were getting into it a lot. We were out three nights a week, 
And we'd come home and just get super stoned and drunk until five in the morning and craft up all these crazy stoner ideas, you know, about this and that. And I had this idea, someday I'm going to do a show, you know, it's going to be great. It's going to be, you know, kind of like, I've always been intrigued with the, the late night concept. You know, grew up watching Johnny right, Carson, right, and right. watched the transition from Carson to Leno. And I remember and, that. I remember yeah. Carson, all the curtains, oh, I, and 25 I loved it. curtains opening yeah. at the start. I loved it when Leno was, would, would guest host for Carson. I always really liked him. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up on that stuff and I loved when the comedians would come on. I just craved that moment when stand-ups would come on. And, and anyway, so I had this idea in my head that I, I wanted to create a show that had kind of a stand, uh, a late night sensibility, but also was there, you know, at this point I'd been taking, drinking up a lot of Bill Hicks, a lot of Joe Rogan, you know, some of these comedians that are more like the philosopher comics, you mm-hmm. know? And so I really want to create something that was uh, an opportunity to drop some knowledge and, and provoke thought as not just entertain, you know? And so I had this idea and thought maybe in five or seven years, you know, when I'm a better writer, I'll, uh, I'll try it out, you know? Well, uh, several months later, I was at a party one night and uh some of the guys from a local from the metro bar were there and they hit me up they're like hey you know we were talking about you the other day and wondered if you might be willing to host an open mic night for us and i was just drunk enough to be kind of honest at this point and i said oh that sounds pretty boring i don't really want to host an open mic night because that (laughs) i mean (laughs) god that would be the worst thing in the world i mean I want to go to the open mic nights. I want to benefit from them, but I don't want to facilitate them because I'm a selfish bastard. Okay. That being said, <laughs> uh, I said, but, but I don't want to host an open mic, but I have an idea. I have this idea for this show and blah, blah, blah. And I kind of laid it all out. And, um, and they said, wow, that's a great idea. We should go tell Jeff Hacker, the manager of Metro Bar. Let's go tell him tomorrow. So we go tell Jeff Hacker and Jeff's like, holy shit, that's the best idea I've heard all year. And I hear a lot of ideas. If anybody can do it, you can do it. Let's do it. And so I was really inspired by, I mean, Jeff Hacker saying that, uh, I thought, okay. Um, if he believes you in if you, If he then, believes in me, yeah. honestly, as cheesy as this sounds, Jeff Hacker, if you hear this, this whole thing is because he believed in me enough to at least say that sentence, you know? Because then I went home and started calling people, and 33 days later, I had my first show with Rocky Anderson on stage. I remember that. Yeah. Jake Shannon, uh, Blake Bard. And, uh, you know, 120 people in the audience had a, a wildcat strike was our house band. And it was a huge success. It blew my mind. And, um, so that just started the ball rolling. And, um, so, so about what year was this? Uh, th- this is 2013. So you're still a postman at this time. Um, at, at when you're doing the show at, at Metro at, at this point, or no, did you I, go back to doing, I, photography? I had, uh, I was back to doing photography full time. I, uh, I engineered my own layoff from the postal service. How'd it go? Uh, really well. Tell me about this. Yeah, I mean, seriously, <laughs> I, good. I need, I might need to take some tips. For yeah, this. Chris does. Well, I mean, I, I told you guys <laughs> how, no. how I, uh, I had been, you know, sleeping no more than two to four hours a night yeah. for, for four years. Like, I honestly think I had some near death experiences during that time. There are, there are a couple times I'd go to bed at night and have these very suspicious pains in my chest. And I would honestly think, I don't know, maybe this is it. Maybe it's your last night. Lights out, folks. You know, like, lights out. Maybe this, maybe this is the one. Yeah. I mean, I honest to God thought that uh, a lot of times. But did you want that? You probably, no, I didn't want that, but I was just, I guess, you you know what is great? You, you spent, you said you spent some time, like, you get, I guess, don't you do all these, uh, these, these, times where you are able to get out of your own skin and just like you know objectively analyze the biomechanics that your fingers work you know and just, yeah you know what i'm talking about yeah was it one of those times where you're just like oh my heart is like how much pain can i tolerate um, you know and like huh, look at if it stops it stops and you I just like are was, in the observe you're like in the, in the eye of the observer at it that may point have been in, it may have been a combination of that and also something called learned helplessness <laughs> that uh what what they found there's this a famous study in psychology where they'll take a, a dog and put it into a cage and this cage has a metal grid floor and it's partitioned into two sides and there's a fence that, that serves as the partition and it's short enough the dog can go over the fence and what they'll do is they'll um, at one point put an electric current through one of the halves of the cage and the dog will you know yelp and jump over to the other side to safety and they do that a couple times and then they'll start electrifying both sides and you know what the dog eventually does? Just sits there and takes it. Doesn't try to escape anymore. It just fucking takes it. And just, yeah. 
And so was this like a time was like the heart pain thing normal or or is this no, one of those times like I want no, to progress no. the story I, here but I, I would not be at all surprised if someday when I make it back into the doctor he's like dude you survived four heart attacks and dodged diabetes like three times I don't know how you're still alive but yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure I had some crazy symptoms so to engineer my layoff from the postal service <laughs> yeah I was pretty sick yeah and I I mean it, that's kind of a long mentally and physically. Uh, more physically, you know, yeah. I was really exhausted mentally. Um, but I, I mean, I can tell you about how that all went down. It has, there's some technicalities with how it works with the union and PTO and time on. Yeah, we don't need stuff. to get into it. I'm re- recording. You it's know? boring. <laughs> but you did it intelligently and you got what you wanted? Yeah. Yeah. Cheers, man. Yeah. Thanks. There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you went, you did your first show that yeah. you did like a live show. How many of those have you done? Cause you've done a handful. The live shows. Yeah. Um, I've probably done close to twenty of them, and and you're it's a continuous like you're continually doing them, right? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're roughly one. once a month. You know, there have been a couple months where it's not been on that schedule. You know, okay. there's a, a little period where it slowed down, but yeah, about once a month. So, so let's back up just a little bit. You're doing the show at Metro. At what? When did the radio, the K Talk, come in? It, All right. So the radio it, it, thing about came this on. time, or yeah, it was around there. It was. Um, so my first. One of my first, on that first show, I had Jake Shannon on the show, and he's a local hypnotist, and he had a radio show at K-Talk. He's a, he was uh, involved in the Libertarian Party here in town, and I knew him through my photo business, because I'd done his family portraits a few times, and, and we'd talked about politics, and so we, we were friends on Facebook, and we knew that we were of a like mind, you know, and he knew about my show. And so, you know, the show started in, in uh, it was February of 2013, Fast forward to um, August of 2013. I'm getting ready to go to Burning Man. And at this point in my life, I'm seriously considering um, the whole, I mentioned like leaving town, just taking my photography on the road, get the hell out of Dodge, try to find, you know, greener pastures someplace else for the art. And I was really just millimeters away. I was, I was almost, I was pretty prepared to just go to Burning Man and not come home. Just, just travel. Just go, and then from Black Rock City, maybe go to San Francisco, and then maybe go down from there, and just just have a chain of uh, just a tour, or and just see what. Great happens. photography on that route. It would have been amazing, yeah. And so I was that I was so so close to doing that. Jake Shannon called me up one day in August, just like a week before I was to leave for Burning Man, and he said, "Hey, I'm going on vacation. I'm wondering if you'd uh, host my radio show for me for two weeks while I'm gone." And it was, uh, it would start the day after Burning Man. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, I'm the type, I believe in say yes and then figure out how later. And so I said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And, uh, so I, I, I went in to the station over at K Talk to get trained on how to, how to do the show. No prior training none, before this. None. No, I have no background in journalism, broadcasting, none of that. No, I, no podcast that you've done the side, nothing. No. Just listen to a lot just, of podcasts. Just listening. That's it. Yeah, I that's like it. this. This is where I started too. So <laughs> that's so I go in and uh and he says, Oh, by the way, so I I'm not exactly going on vacation, I'm quitting. And so um they no promises, no guarantees. They may ask you to stay if they like what you're doing, maybe not, who knows? But just that that could happen. You should know that. So I go to Burning Man knowing with this thing of like, do I carry forward with my this go on the road with photography thing, or do I be open to a radio show? Maybe possibly how fucking crazy is that? You know? And I made up my mind while I was out there that I would be totally open to the radio thing. So I came back and did a couple shows and uh, they asked me to stay. So that was that. Before we get into the radio talk, I want to hear about burning man. I've never uh, been. Have you been Brian? I haven't been. I've always wanted. Uh, to go. This I, I've got really a buddy anyway. that's told me a lot of stories. He, he, he went deep too. It was great, great story. So, so I've only been once. Okay. How long? Like how long were you there for? Like uh, a week or a whole week? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I've only been the one time. Uh, I want to give that disclaimer. So I'm not this big experienced burner, but I drank deeply while I was there, and I, I had a really, really great experience. I don't think I could have had any better of an experience. In fact, it was just Burning Man. So I, I went out there. I mean, I, I've I've known about Burning Man for for several several years, and when I would see the photos of it. I just felt really just deeply called in my guts to go be a part of this thing and to go witness it and participate in it. And I don't know how else to say that other than I just felt like I needed to go. Like really it was just called to it. And so finally after a couple of years of that, I 
the stars lined up and I was able to go and, uh, I went out there thinking, you know, like, Hey, I'm a pretty creative guy. I've got my show, you know, I do photography, blah, blah, blah. And I went out there and I had my ass handed to me creatively in the most spectacular, beautiful, grandiose way. The art that happens out there is on a level and on a, a vibrational level. I've just both a scale and a, and a reason that I've never seen before. I mean, Burning Man happens out in the middle of the Black Rock Desert. There are, there's no power out there, no water, nothing. It is the middle of nowhere. Think the salt, the, the salt flats, except the chalk dust flats. That's essentially what it is. It's just a dry lake bed. And, um, 70,000 people go out there and set up a city that is highly, highly organized. I mean, it's the kind of city Brigham Young would be proud of. It's, <laughs> it's, the streets are named. It's a grid system. It's, it's, it's like living in Salt Lake in a way. You and know? did you know anybody or did you just want to go by yourself? So I knew I had, um, I didn't know anybody out there. Per, well, let me back up. I had some acquaintances I knew were going to be out there, but the people I was to camp with, I'd never met before in my life. It was just this thing. My buddy said, Hey, go camp, go camp with uh, my friends. They're expecting you, you know? So I drive out there. And, um, the drive in there is crazy intense and long. How well, many hours from Salt Lake? Okay. So here's the deal. So it, you go, to, you go to Reno. Salt Lake to Reno is an easy drive. It's the easiest eight hours I've ever done. But then once you're in Reno, then you go north on this little road that starts winding up into the Black Rock Desert and it turns into a two lane road, one lane each direction. 70,000 people trying to travel this thing. So you talked about this on your show. When I you got to have. the thing, they had you do a, a yeah, dirt I'll, angel. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. tell you about that. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so getting in there. So I turned off. I left Reno and I left. You know, I left I eighty at about six p.m. on a Sunday night. I didn't get into my camp until three a.m. Monday morning. Wow. So I was in my car from you know six p.m. <laughs> until three a.m. and <laughs> nine hours to go. How nine far? Nine hours to drive about a hundred miles. Yeah. And most of that's not driving. Most of it is you're just in a complete standstill on this one lane of this one lane road. It's two lanes each way or one lane each way. And it, it was kind of a crazy thing. You're just out there in the middle of the desert and traffic just stops and people get out of their cars and start meeting each other and passing around treats and hula hooping <laughs> and playing music. <laughs> like trail mix. You know, <laughs> so it, it was a, uh, it was a, the communal atmosphere already was emerging on the road in. And when you get there, the, the road then splits into two lanes and four lanes and eight lanes and then 12 lanes to the welcoming gate. And finally you're making it onto the playa, which is what they call the, the desert floor where, where it all happens. And, um, and when you get to the wel- welcoming gate, when I got there, I was ornery and tired and I did not want to fuck around. I just wanted to find my camp and go to sleep. I was so, so tired. And you get there and there's a, a, a greeter for every person that comes in. You get out of the car. They check, you know, you've already checked your ticket at the, the ticket gate. Now you're at the greeter gate and you get out of your car and this person gives you a big, huge hug and they say, welcome home. And it sounds a little cheesy. And at first I was like, Oh, it's a little hokey, but whatever, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, I don't care. And, um, then the next thing is if they find out you're a virgin, like you've never been before, you have to get down in the dust and make a dust angel, like a snow angel. And one of the, and I was really, really tempted to tell her to go fly a kite. You know, I'm like, dude, I don't want to get dirty. I'm tired. I just want to go camp and sleep, please. But I just, little voice in my head pops in. It's like, no, make the fucking snow angel, man. So I get down in the dirt and do it. And then I realized right then the reason for it. Burning Man is like the zero point field. There any, any possibility exists out there. All possibilities exist. But you have to be willing to say yes to new things. And if you're in the mode of saying no, it's nothing's going to go down. Nothing interesting will happen to you. And so that was the first opportunity for you to break the barrier of this idea that you're going to be clean all week because you're just, it's a dusty place. And number two, to try a new thing, you know? And so I did it and that was cool. And then as the week wore on, I mean, the first thing I did that night, I found my camp. I didn't even know if I was in the right place, just parked my car, got on my bike and went for a ride. And, um, one of the first things I visited out there was the temple. And every year they build a temple out there. And it's um, what it kind of sounds like. It's a dedicated, sacred space for people to pray and contemplate and meditate and um, commemorate either people that have gone on or just things they want to let go of. And, and uh, I have never 
I, I mean, I grew up Mormon, you know, I grew up going to the temple. I know more about the LDS temple than 99% of Mormons do. You know, I, I just, I don't know, I soaked it up. I've gone so many times and never in my life have I walked into an edifice and felt the presence of the divine like I did at Burning Man. It was palpable. It was just powerful and incredibly beautiful. I spent so much time in the temple out there. It is such a profound thing. And, um, but on the art level, one of the things that really, that really blew me away. I mean, I, here I am. I've made my career in photography and photography is about preserving things, right? About, you know, you freeze things, freeze things so they don't go away. That's what it's all about. Photography is about, you know, attachment in a way. And Burning Man is all about let's create the biggest, most beautiful, incredible thing we can and let's enjoy it for five days and then let's burn it down. <laughs> It'll never exist again. And I had never seen such amazing art that was built only to last for a few short hours and then to, to go away. And, and it was, uh, it, to me, it was not only just like a lesson. To say it was a lesson would be to put it a little bit lightly. It was almost like a, a sacrament of, of a way of moving through life, of being completely present. When you're in the presence of art that's going to be burned down in two or three days, you don't think about anything else other than what is right in front of you. And Burning Man compelled me to be present just to the, to the, to the now in a way I've never been in my life because there's, you have no other choice to, to just be immediately completely present to everything that's around you. And I, I mean, and it's so big, you'll never even see it all. That's the other thing. Another big lesson I had at Burning Man. I mean, it's just so vast. You cannot see all of it. And so I realized I had to make a decision. I could either spend the week cruising around the city, taking in everything I could, uh, in a very superficial level and just sample here, sample there and just, and, and, and see maybe 20% of Burning Man and still miss 80% of it, but sample a lot of stuff. Or I could just let myself sink deeply into whatever I run into and maybe miss 90% of Burning Man, but have some actual experiences. And, um, so that's what I did. I allowed myself to just miss most of Burning Man and just sink deeply into the few things I really connected to. That, that ended up becoming kind of a metaphor for life as well, because how many times in life do we go through this, especially nowadays, especially in this day of, of, of Tinder and social media and the million, billion, trillion options we all have to interact with a, a vast number of people and things at all times. It's so easy to just do that. Just sample here, sample there, sample this, sample that. And, and um, it really inspired me to be a little more brave about just allowing myself to sink deeply into an experience rather than be preoccupied with all of my options. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and so, I mean, those are just a couple of things I learned out there, but it was, it was one of the most profound experiences of my life. Would you ever go again? Oh God. Yes. Yes. What, I, what, what's held you back from going? <laughs> well, last year I didn't go, uh, cause my life was pretty crazy. I, I was in a pretty strange, uh, relationship, pretty weird time in my life. And, uh, I don't, I'm not going to blame it on her. It was me. I, I just, my, my going to Burning Man is a huge commitment. It's really expensive and it takes about 10 days. How uh, expensive I, is Burning Man? Well, the, I mean, the ticket is 400 bucks, which yeah. isn't the expensive. Part. And what does that include? Like that, that includes that, just getting in. Just get, not even the campsite or nothing. Oh, that, that's your campsite. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's just getting in. But beyond that, you have to, um, you have to get your own food, fuel, time off of work. You know, if I you mean, have a job, <laughs> if you have a job, or even if you don't, even, more probably more importantly, if you don't have a job, that's opportunity cost. So yeah, I mean, it, it's it's vastly expensive to go out to it. And people have this idea of Burning Man being just a bunch of hippies out in the desert. Not so. Burning Man to me was a was like Boy Scout camp, but a grown up version full of engineers and builders and creators who are very prosperous. Like you, you have to have a lot of resources to go out there and do that. So I mean it. Would you go to Burning Man? Ryan? Absolutely, I've been quite interested in it in a long time. Yeah, because that what it's coming up here, like in August or September or something. End of August. It's End always of August. The, it's always the week leading up to Labor Day. Wow, man, I'd yeah. love to. If there's anybody going, send me an email. No, I, I I can't. Yeah, I couldn't, I, go, I couldn't uh, go this year, but uh, I I'd, I'd love to go. I I had a friend who went and like halfway across. I don't know if he was in Elko or whatever, but he saw on his GPS where Black Rock City is. Yeah. And he saw where the freeway went and the route to get there, and he's like, Psh, "I'm just be. I'm gonna take a straight line." He had a he had an LR Ford Land Rover and started just going by his GPS across the desert. Did he make it? Yeah, he said halfway across there was this other guy in like a 
G wagon Mercedes doing the same thing, <laughs> and they were just like, yeah, you know, and that's awesome. Yeah, he he ended up making it, and then when he got there, you know, he's the kind of guy who who like you said, he more surrendered to the experience, and he's like, I just I just really got my creative face kicked in you know yeah. about seeing he's like I, I never and he explained like some of the some of the parades some of the things some of the signs some of the events and oh my gosh and and um you know he's like there, there's a shaman guy with a big eagle wing like a like a full eagle wing like and he's waving it and he's giving blessings to the hottest lineup of girls waiting an hour in line <laughs> that I had ever seen. He's like, I don't, he's like, it finally made sense why I can't get chicks because I don't speak their language. <laughs> and, yeah. and he, and he just had so much reflective learning and he came back humbled, excited, centered. Yeah. And I, I mean, listening to his stories, I was like, I'd love to. In, in your stories, I was like, Man, I, I could talk for four hours about it. I'll warn you right now. So, feel well, free no, to I just, I just really wanted cool. to, I just wanted yeah. to lightly touch it because you know, I, yeah. I was, I remember it's, it's so, you talking about it on your radio show, and, yeah. and I remember uh, reading about it places. As, and, as lightly as you did want to touch it, let's just go like a touch deeper because I, it was one of the top five <laughs> experiences of my life. We, honestly. we okay, yeah. well, we we live and we interact daily in a city where where you know our ingrained protocols like we don't have a confederate flag flying above our state, but we might as well you know in our own way in a lot of ways, like if you look at our state legislature, it's completely run by a you know a theocracy, and there are so many things that the theocracy gives you you know like you've said you've you've gone really deep on the on the temple experiences you've gone really really thoroughly obviously you're you know a passionate driven person if you're involved in something you're going to feel it all the way through and understand every nuance of all of it sounds like and my experience with mormonism left me wanting right and i went deep on it and i didn't go on a mission i didn't get all the way there but i was raised you know virtually shiite mormon like (laughs) you're mormon or you're mormon or you're grounded you know like if you're late to church one minute your car is lost for the week you know like it was, it was an important part of our upbringing and yeah. to, to the point where I was like, Hey, let's step back and like examine why we're yelling at each other about following rules. Because I think that that's not one of I the think rules. Jesus didn't do that. Right. That wasn't sure. what he did. You know, so the, there imagine, was the, imagine the Lord being like, get your shoes on. We're going to be late. Yeah. You little, <laughs> you little punk. I told you to go to bed. You know, now you're, now you're, now you're tired. You do you see? <laughs> Leave your sister alone. Yeah, dude, I'm, you're revisiting the traumas of my youth. So I, you know, there, but, but, but also we're, 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 it was all in the name of doing the best yeah. and raising kids. And one of my dad's favorite quotes is ever, ever, I was his first son and I was, we, we always, I would challenge him. And he, when my favorite quotes he would always say, and he started saying it when I was like five was, Hey, this is my first time being a dad. You got to take it easy on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I love that quote. Cause I was like, you know, I, I'm still not a father and you're, you're good at being one, you know, and you Chris isn't one yet. And it's like, of course there's things to learn but the burning man experience stands you know it as to me or at least i you know not being there but you know i'm very very respectful of the way that other people express their creativity and really go deep in ways that would defy their tribe and they've already moved past that tribal language and that tribal experience and they're willing to like the like the part of mormonism that left me wanting i i've still got really really great close friends that are epic that you know try and pull me back into their reflective vision of what it what it all means but well speaking of tribes i gotta say one thing about burning man um at the end of so remember remember i mentioned that the traditional greeting that they first when you get there she's they say welcome home Mm -hmm. after i remember that the first day you spend kind of adjusting to the environment because it's acidic and hot and insanely dry and it's it's kind of difficult at first but once you kind of adjust into being in that place then all the, the dots start connecting. And I, I remember riding around and um, just seeing these people. One of the principles is radical self-expression, people expressing themselves in the most uninhibited ways, artistically, socially, everything. I mean, seeing art that exists for no other reason than somebody had an idea and decided it was to just make it. Like, there was no second guessing. Like, this is a weird fucking idea. Let's build it, you know? It was this, some of the most genuine art I've ever seen. And I, I, I remember... And the music that happens out there, just everything is so, so huge. And I, I remember thinking one night, realizing like, this, this is my tribe. Yeah. These are my people. You know, I mean, it, it was everything I loved as a kid. I, if you could, if I could go back in a time machine and tell my, my eight year old self, like, look, dude, someday 
you're going to go to this place where everything, there's like blow torches everywhere. Everything gets to burn. It's fire, everything. Hot naked girls, the most amazing electronic music you've ever heard in your life. Bikes, um, <laughs> camping, <laughs> beer, drugs, you know, like ev- everything you want is there if you want it. Everything, you know, I would have never believed it. You know, it's like the most, it's like Boy Scout camp times a million, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. minus the BB guns. Anyway, that being said, one of the most profound things for me was um, the night of the man burn. So every every year they have there's two main edifices that the Burning Man organization builds. There's the temple, and then the man. And the man is what most people think of when they you know there's many. It, it's always that kind of stick figure guy, and mm-hmm. and he usually has a, a different base every year, some sort of a different foundation. But the the man itself is usually about the same. And at the end of, and it's at the center of the city, and it's kind of the icon that everyone looks to. It's almost like an idol in a sense, except for they will never tell you what it represents. It is a, it's a meaningless symbol. It's there for you to put your own meaning onto. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the week, it burns. And so at the end of the week, the whole city gathers around the man, and 70,000 people gathered around this ginormous 200 foot wooden edifice that's going to burn down. And, um, I, I, not only were there 70,000 people, but there are these thing, things called art cars. Think of uh, like a parade float meets a nightclub portable DJ sort of arrangement with like a self-contained nightclub. Lights and, and huge sound and DJs and dance floors. I mean, just hundreds of these things gathered around the man with 70,000 people. And then within the circle of that, you had 12 different what they call uh, fire conclaves, which are these groups of fire dancers from different regions of the world. There are burners from all over the world there, all doing these different fire dances in their different costumes. Some were naked, some were in ornate costumes, some were just all varieties. And it kind of reminded me of the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, you know, and all the different countries come out and they kind of do their thing. It was like that. And there are people out there with drums and the, and the, the sound systems are just throbbing their, their music. And, and there's just this, the desert was just pulsing with energy and, 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 and rhythm. And the man is there in the center about to burn and there are lights on it and, and, you know, lasers flashing all over the place. And I, I remember, and then finally fireworks go off to start the man burning. And I remember looking around as the desert just, just throbbing with this energy. And I realized, I just had this realization that I've been here before. This gathering around is something that we humans have been doing for thousands of years. And this was the biggest tribe I'd ever been a part of, 70,000 people. How many times in the human experience do you find 70,000 people who gather together in unity? There's plenty of times it happens in opposition, like sports sports events mm. mo- mostly. You know, There are plenty of arenas that will hold that many people, but it's always an us versus them mentality. But this is the first time I'd been around 70,000 people who were both there in unity, but yet ambiguity. They weren't there because the man means something different to everybody. So it was almost like a religious experience without some religion telling you what you had to believe. It was just completely open. I, I don't got it. was just, it was incredible. So it sounds like you had to be there really to yeah, experience yeah. it. You really come. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I wanna thanks talk- for good. Thanks for all that, man. I loved yeah. it. I want so, to talk about your uh, photography because I'm oh, yeah. actually not very familiar with it before we completely run out of time here. But I want to talk about your photography. Right. I was re- nude photography. Oh, yeah. Is that is that kind of your specialty? Yeah, I guess so. Well, let's talk about it. Because, I mean, especially here in Utah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, how, is there a market much for nude photography? Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's all you have to say? Come on. <laughs> yeah. What else do you want? <laughs> well, no. I mean, like, uh, well, I mean, it, like, for who? Businesses or for, uh, for people or, or? In my experience, the market is primarily... Middle-aged women that just want to feel pretty again. Okay. After having two kids and a white picket fence, 3.2 cars and a mortgage and a husband of 11 years. And what got you interested in that versus family portraits versus um, city life versus landscape versus... <laughs> what got me interested in it? I what, mean, besides what, looking at naked bodies. What got bodies? me interested in photographing naked women? Let's see. <laughs> how um, did you manage? Yeah, I mean, how did you get next, so lucky? After this, we're going to talk about why chocolate is good. No. That'll be our next topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but I mean, everybody's what? not so lucky. <laughs> why are puppies why are so puppies? cute? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Topic three. Damn it, puppies. <laughs> Quit it. Uh, it all it all started years ago when I, I uh, my first major girlfriend after my divorce. Um, I'd been doing photography for a few years, and we had this idea to do a nude shoot, and I'd never done one before. And so we did one, 
and it was awesome. And I mean, it's it was it would be it will some, maybe someday to be the basis of a real, like some smut mutt novel, maybe smut smut. You're halfway through smut the novel. Era. You Clit, get the outline. Clit lit. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. Some. I don't know. It, it, it was sensual and erotic and incredible all at the same time. And and one of the pieces that came from that is I think one of my finest pieces of from my photo career so far. Like I, it was just an amazing magical moment, and I kind of got hooked on it. You know, I just love I love the female form. And I love photographing it. And I've gone through a lot of phases where I, I was really into it just for that, that basis. And then I kind of hit this point where I decided I, I don't like doing it anymore. Like, I don't like, so when you so say, you don't like chocolate anymore is what no, you're saying. That's ter- <laughs> it's terrible. No, when you say nude Some photography, are though, I mean, to be really honest, there's, there's the retail side. There's doing, doing as like boudoir photography for regular customers who just call me. They've never met me before. They just want, sexy pictures done and then there's working with models which are two very different things is it all based off of referrals in or is there like a place in the yellow pages sexy photography oh there might be but God. <laughs> <laughs> no i i just have a website i got yeah, you yeah okay. I, I don't i don't seek it out they so you're come, still doing photography they just, then? yeah they just come to me you're still doing it then yeah and not not a ton i mean uh yeah, here and there okay yeah. so yeah. if somebody's looking for sexy pictures what about of guys what do you do of guys Oh yeah. yeah, I've yeah. done that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you were just saying females. So. Yeah, I mean, because they're way more interesting to me. But yeah. but you know, guys, uh, if you have the money, then call and I'll I'll take care of you. I want to get into uh, one of the things I'm kind of intrigued about. I want to find out when did the pantyhose and the heels come in? To play? <laughs> oh, when did that kind of come into the oh, picture? Gosh, when I was young. Kind of to be your okay, okay, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, but that's I mean, kind of become your like almost a signature. Yeah, it has. Paul yeah, Wayne. yeah. What a lot of people, uh, people, it's becoming an interesting part of my personal brand because I guess simply because no one else does it. And you're not wearing any tonight, though. No, I, I was re- hoping you were. Ah, uh, yeah. It's a Tuesday, man. <laughs> <laughs> Am I not give, special enough? Give the man some downtime, Chris. <laughs> not on our first date. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. I, so, so that all came about, uh, the kind of the, the, the compressed story. I know I've gone on at length about some other things. So yeah, when I, when I was younger, I realized that I, I enjoyed wearing them. I like how it looked. I like how it feels, you know, and, uh, it was my deepest, darkest secret. You know, I thought, Oh gosh, this is going to be a weird thing. That's going to keep me from ever being able to like, people are going to think I'm weird. I'll never be able to have a wife or a girlfriend because they'll never tolerate anything like this. How did you, did so, your wife so tolerate it? You, you were a young child. Yeah. Yeah. Wearing okay. Heels. Okay. But the well, first time heels, you put just, on just, like, just, just like spandex, like even like, like, you know, like shorts, bicycle like, shorts. I don't know. They feel kind of cool. Like, like, you know, I'd wear them under, okay. under our, our, so you get our that. shorts. Yeah. I Take wore that them. Kind of feels kind of cool. And jock straps felt like shit. Spandex only felt cool, and then you put on, you know, you go do your workout All right, so with you your shorts over about. the top, whatever. So the spandex thing, you multiply yeah. that by like 30, and that's what we're talking about. But yeah, so you're whole, like, this is cool, and now really it's good. so yeah, taboo yeah. that I'm going to be ostracized. Um, Yeah, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, gosh, I really like doing it, I like how it feels, but I get that this is completely far out and taboo, and holy shit, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to make a choice between what I like to do and what people want me to do, you know, and anyway, short, short story. Is that uh, we can hear the long story? You know? Okay, I, 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 yeah, I, this I, is I, your I, show, bro. Yeah, you're okay, the guest. Okay, okay. 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 I, yeah, didn't, I, I, just, I didn't know if you had a time limit. No, right? no, no, no. There's okay. not. I, there was just. There's so much about you. I want to. Uh, but oh, okay. I find this part so interesting. Okay. Yeah. So so here's the deal. Um. Yeah that that was a thing that uh, like I said I uh, I grew up very Mormon. Yeah. You know you mentioned Shiite Mormon. I like you know I. I like that term. It Sunni Mormon? Sunni Mormon. Yeah. <laughs> pretty close. Just, just, yeah. just I mean, at war with anything other than what you believe. Pretty yeah. much. Pretty yeah. much a Sunni yeah. Mormon. Yeah, yeah. Very it's Jihad yeah. Mormon. <laughs> so much. Holy shit. There's fundamentalists everywhere. I was yep. one, I was one I of was them. I was one of them. I was one of them. Man. So did your <laughs> ex-wife know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she know. So, so that's one of those things that um, I really kept to myself, kept under my hat. Until, you know, I mean, she knew about it a little bit. She got a, a little, she saw the tip of the iceberg for one, one moment. What was her reaction? Bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it reinforced. Way late for sacrament meeting, yeah. bad. <laughs> Super, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you are not wearing those to sacrament meeting today. <laughs> no, it wasn't like that. It's close, though. Well, let's share. Let's just say, let's just say. Because I want to protect her privacy as sure, well. Sure, sure, yeah. fair enough. Let's fair just enough. say I introduced the idea at one point in time, early in our marriage, and um, she began to entertain the idea, but then got com- 
completely weirded out and freaked out. And um, she talked to her one bitch friend. No, it happened no. faster than that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, <laughs> now that that had to go back on on the back burner in my mind, you know. One day, but fast forward to um, actually the girl that I did the first boudoir shoot with. She she was a, a pivotal person in my life. Not only did she kind of start, no, not only did my boudoir photography career begin because of her, but she was the first relationship I had where, um, you know, in the beginning of a relationship, you start telling each other your secrets like, oh, I'm kind of like this and I'm into this and oh, I hope this isn't too weird, but I do that. You know what I mean? That whole thing. Mm-hmm. Chris, you, you, I have you, no idea what you're talking. No, no not I, at all. I know absolutely what Bullshit. you're talking. No, I do, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Chris was like, "Oh my god, I got some more secrets." <laughs> anyway, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, we get into that stage of the conversation, and one of the things I'd learned from my marriage is the importance of really owning your personal truths. You know, like really knowing what your truths are and sharing them with other people, even if it's hard to do. And so I did. I was just like, hey, yeah, so I got this thing, this uh, this trick up my sleeve, you know, and I told her about it. And, and I was so afraid she was just going to be like, yeah, so uh, I've got to go right now. Uh, I've got to go wash my cat's hair and uh, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> yeah. And I'd never hear from her again. But I was willing to take the risk, you know. And they say in order to get the girl, you have to be willing to lose the girl. And I, I believe that. So I told her and her response changed my whole world right there. She goes, wow, that's really interesting. That's pretty hot. I can see why you would like doing that. I like wearing them too. We should play around with that sometime, you know? And so we did. And so all of a sudden here I had evidence contrary to every fear I'd had as a child and as a teenager that a beautiful, intelligent, sexy, funny wonderfully attractive on every level woman would not only be able to tolerate it, but would be totally into it. Everything was different after that. Um, because if there was one, I knew there could be others, you know, it's just a numbers game at that point. And so anyway, what that led to is, um, and you know, that relationship obviously didn't last, uh, you know, we were together for a couple of years and man, whatever that, that, that came and went. Um, we are very good friends to this day though. I should say she, if she's listening, she knows who she is and you're awesome. But then in following relationships, this emboldened me to be really honest, you know, because I knew, hey, she liked it. If you don't, there's the door. (laughs) And that's been my attitude ever since uh, about most things. And what's been really crazy is ever since then, I've had a string of like really every relationship I've been in has been uh, the, the women that have been in my life either are open to it or they really love it. And it's defied every expectation I've ever had as a kid. And, and so you asked about, I, I, I'm sure you're kind of curious about just the, you know, how it all came about more publicly. I just, you know, uh, there was always the realm of, well, I'm going to tell you about this in our, in our, you know, kind of be kind, closed doors. This is our little secret. But then it evolved into, Hey, there's this fetish party, you know, over at, uh, you know, this is fetish night thing. We should dress up and go. Well, gee, what am I going to do? What do you think I'm going to do? You know? So I would dress up and I rock, you know, I remember the first time I went out, it was for a Halloween party and rocked some, uh, some nylons and some heels and had this sort of botched idea for some, outfit that didn't quite come together but i went out anyway and and it was fun and then it just from there it was like okay i did that on halloween maybe next halloween i'll do it too and then after then it turns into hey there's this club night maybe i should do it there and hey hey, there's this birthday party and it's gonna be kind of crazy you know we're all dressing up why don't you do it there too great so i do that and then pretty soon it just becomes a little more and more known about me and um i've got to be honest um, the social reactions too were just positive all across the board. Really? <laughs> yeah. Like, and, and it just got to the point where, um, it became kind of a, a bit of an unofficial trademark. And then when it came time to, uh, do my show, you know, r- earlier in the conversation, I was talking about when it was time to do my first show at, at Metro Bar. Big question. How do I present myself on stage? Am I going to rock a suit? Am I going to do the, the Dave Letterman thing? Am I going to do the Eddie Izzard thing? Am I going to do the, you know, like, how am I going to present myself on stage? Because I recognize we're talking about branding here. We're talking about, you know, there's some, some bigger issues on the table. And, uh, you know, again, I talked to Jeff Hacker about it and talked to a few people and everybody's like, keep it weird, man. Just do it. Just rock it. So I did. And everybody loved it. Yep. So is there like a special time? Like what makes you, like you said, okay, today's just, you know, 
Oh yeah, a basically. Old, like, is it is it a so weekend thing or or essentially, you, if if the occasion calls for a suit, I'm going to show up in a blazer, tailored shorts, nylons, and heels. That's my suit. Was it tough learning to walk in heels? Actually, no. That's the other weird thing. I'll never forget the first time I put on heels for Halloween. I put them on, and all of a sudden I realized, oh, I totally know how to do this. It's like, and this is one of the reasons. <laughs> I it, I know it sounds weird, but I, I just got it right off the bat. This is one of the reasons I believe in reincarnation. I'm pretty certain that I was a, a hooker in Germany uh, in my last life. Yeah, because I just, I think it carried over. Just makes sense. Totally. This works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Works for me. Yeah. I've never. It's good when you I, harmonize. Wood, I haven't put every yet. part of it. I've come really close to eating shit on a number of occasions, <laughs> <laughs> but I have not done it yet. <laughs> okay. I've got a quote. You know how you said you're going to stand a comedy. You like define your jokes. Like this is my joke. You know, it's like a, a piece of real estate that you, that you all of a sudden own because you yeah. did it first. I had a quote that I wrote down once that I think is still mine. And I mean, debunk me if you've heard it before. Authenticity resonates in across any genre. If, if something is authentic, it doesn't matter if it's sports, music, whatever. If it comes from someone's soul and it's not some like trivial, you know, produced shit for mass consumption, if it's a real thing that works, it resonates. And, I, I and when that. it resonates, it resonates to other people. Like you take the risk, but you're like, Hey, guess what? This has been me since I was five. And, Bam, and then everybody's like, "Holy fuck, I worked. That worked. I loved it." You know, and it, and it just resonates. I I have to agree. That's, that's been like, my, it's a quote. I'd I'd love for some. That's been my experience. My, One of the things I've learned there. from dressing like this is that when you walk into a room or you walk into life or whatever, you show up. You walk into the proverbial room knowing where you're going. Ninety nine percent of people will either politely step out of your way or they'll follow you. People are sheep. Most people are sheep and they're just looking for a leader. And even if they don't agree with what you're doing or like what you're doing, most people recognize that and they'll step out of your way. Like I, I've, I, I have had so little negative feedback. I can barely even reference it. So if you do it with confidence. And yeah. Yeah. You that's, know, that's just it. Know. And, and why like, wouldn't it be confident if it's authentic? Well, there are a hundred. I mean, I mean, to like, you, it you can know, be scary as hell. I'll, I'm not gonna I'll lie. give you that for sure. I yeah, yeah, for it, sure. But, yeah. I mean, there, there have been a few times I'm like, I don't know if I should do this. <laughs> but it, it's one of those things where I can't tell you how many times I've been getting ready to go out to an event or something and been pondering, okay, am I going to rock the pants or the, the nylons and heels tonight? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Take a chance, you know, dress a little more edgy. And every time I do, something awesome happens. Every time it just reinforces, just do it. It seems like it goes back to what you did at Burning Man, where you're like, I'm going to go deep on an experience rather than skim the surface Just and say yes. have some little random bullshit conversation. Exactly. Yeah. To me, Makes the, sense. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Proud of you, man. Thanks. Well, I, I mean, and, and the thing I, the thing I hope, honestly, from it all, I mean, number one, I'm not being altruistic when I dress like that. I'm seriously is, it's just for me. I'm just doing this for me. But, but number two, one of the things I've learned about life that's kind of cool is, when you do operate from a place of authenticity and you're really just doing your thing, there's a kind of magic that comes from it and it can inspire other people recognize it. You're totally right. People recognize that authenticity. And I hope, I mean, no, I don't even want to say hope. Cause like I said, I'm not doing this for some social statement. I'm just doing it. Cause I like those clothes. That's it. Um, but if, by me doing that, somebody at some party or event or on TV or whatever sees me doing that and says, hey, if he can do that, I can be more honest about that I want to be a crazy Democrat from now on. I have to tell my Republican family tomorrow. Or mm -hmm. I need to switch jobs. Or this relationship isn't working for me. Or I want to be in a relationship. Or I need to come out of the closet. Or I need to change this or change that. Or I need to go back to grad school. Or, 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 or whatever it is that is your authentic truth. If my, I don't know, man, like if, if even one person is inspired to do that, then God, I think that would be, uh, more than icing on the cake, you know, like, have you ever had stories? Have you had anybody tell you that, that you've inspired them? Yeah. Motivated them to, to do something. Mm -hmm. to, think, anything that you care to share? Not really. Probably one in particular that comes to mind. I, uh, one night I, I was at a, a club dressed up. And, um, I was hanging out with this dude who was recently divorced and was really trying to get back into the game of meeting girls, you know, and he's pretty nervous about it. 
And I look, I do not profess to be any sort of an expert on women or relationships or dating or anything like that. I think I'm still just wildly clumsy with them. Um, that being said, I've learned a lot of things since my married days. <laughs> um, and I was, anyway, I was hanging out with my buddy and there was this cute girl and I just, I don't know, I just kind of started talking to her for a couple minutes. And she was that girl, you know, when you're out, there's always that girl that everybody's kind of like, she's on a lot of dudes radar, but not many guys go or brave enough to go talk to her, you know? Somehow I ended up talking to her for a minute and he was standing right there with me. And within two minutes, she's like, Oh, take my number here. Call me tomorrow. We got to, we got to, we got to go. We got to get together. But I'm like, all right, cool. You know, here's my phone. Take my number, you know? And, and then, and then it was over and she kind of walked away and and he said to me, he's like, dude, how did you do that? I'm like, I don't know. I just, I was just here, you know? And, and, and he said, can we, can we go to lunch tomorrow? I've got some questions for you. And so, you know, we got together for lunch the next day and he can just, proceeded to quiz me about the same things you guys are asking me. Why do you do this? When did it come from? Blah, 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 blah. And the short story is that he also has a kind of fascination in his own life that uh, he's only, you know, same kind of thing. It, he was afraid that women would reject him for it. And he's, he's created these limiting beliefs. And I'm mm-hmm. not even going to tell you what his thing was, because here's the thing. It doesn't it's, it's matter. It's not relevant. Yeah. It totally doesn't matter. It Anyone could who be, hears this, attach whatever yours is to the Here's the thing, story. guys. Everybody, all you guys are listening to the podcast right now, you all, men and women, all have a thing that you are afraid people are going to reject you for. Everybody has one. Maybe m- multiple things. And, and he had one, too. And he shared with me what his thing was. And he, he's like, only two people know about this, my mom and my ex-wife, and now you, you know, and he laid it out and he, he was just really mystified and, and inspired that I could have this thing that should, by most people's measure, make me completely repulsive to women, you know, like what was straight girls going to like that? You know, it's weird. It's confusing. It's, uh, it's strange, but for him to see that it wasn't that, that it was actually an attractor type thing, um, really inspired him. And I think showed him that there are no rules. There are very, very few actual rules in life. For the most part, we create our own realities, you know, and, and we, we make up our own rules and we create our own universes. And, and, um, anyway, that, that was, it, it was a cool thing. And, and I think since then he's, he's had a little bit better of a situation. Um, I, you know, we don't talk a ton these days, but, and I, I don't know. And I've had people, just anonymous people on the internet, write me and say nice things. And anyway, it. it, it so some cool stories. Cool stories. Yeah, there's well, been, been some nice stuff. It's nice when you take like a. a Okay, so say your life has just kind of been not working. You're not clicking. You're not in sync. You you you, you go to bed just you either disconnected or in some way just uh, some degree of of blah. You wake up the same way. You in in. And say you've already shelved your thing, you know, because you want to conform. Right. And then you take an authenticity bath by hanging out with a Paul Duane in a moment of like, you don't give a fuck and you're rocking your thing and you get the hot girl. And it, when when that those moment happens and you're saying like, it, it's almost like you're a ripple effect. You just dropped a big rock in their pond and the boom, boom, boom. They can see if they made the move, if they, you know, what the boom. And like they just can reorganize their thoughts because someone's brave. And that's a neat gift to give is to be yourself do what you do and do it f- from the place that you do it for the do it out of solitude yeah there's it's solitude there's whatever i mean yeah. there's so many people i know that wake up they, they go up in the mountains or they, they're awake for the sunrise they, you know I, I follow like photographers and whatnot and like there, there's people that do things where i'm like that's an inconvenient human experience and it's resonating oh my gosh i'm inspired you know, and, and there's so many genres that that covers. Yeah. You know, and they, these experiences, I tell you what, that guy, I mean, what a gift to give somebody the vision of what a, a free life can look like or a life living freely instead of living imprisoned in your own fixed beliefs. Cause fixed beliefs are so dangerous. Like that's one thing I've really learned out of growing out of a fundamentalist background is that fixed beliefs are so limiting. And, 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 and I shouldn't say dangerous, like don't beware, you know, enjoy them, like learn, be yourself. But, but when, when you pass your limits, your predetermined limits, 
the joy and the thrill that you go to bed with that night and like you wake up and recalibrate your future experience. It's a really cathartic, beautiful time. And that's where, that's what growth is. That's what life is, yeah. you know? Yeah. So how can people, how can people find your radio show? When, uh, just, what are you on? The easiest thing I, I'm on, um, well, first and foremost, really, if people just go to my website, that's the hub of everything, pauldewayne.net, P-A-U-L-D-U-A-N-E.net. But the radio show is on, uh, here on the Wasatch Front, it's on KTALK 6.30 a.m., uh, but we, the show syndicated nationally on the Liberty Radio Network and, and some other things. And um, so uh, there's a mobile app you can download. But if you just drop by the website, depending on where you're located, that will point you the right way. So, and you podcast it as well. That's actually oh, yeah, how, yeah, that's yeah. how I listen. Okay, yeah, to it's it. on iTunes. Yeah, so yeah, it's on iTunes. It's on iTunes. It's on iHeartRadio. Uh, yeah, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, that's how I listen to it. And and do you have any like shows coming up? Like uh, that you want to talk about at all? Like mm. anything to promote? Uh, to promote? I mean, yeah. There's there's some stuff coming. Um, but but follow I, you maybe online maybe to get more. Yeah. So so the thing I'm probably most excited about right now is that in the very near future we're going to be launching a a late night talk show on Park City TV. And, um, that, Sweet. uh, got a few ducks we have to get in a row first for that, but. Is that an FCC regulated event? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> stick with your, stick with what you're good at. Yeah. It's going to be on Comcast. Periscopers invited or Periscopers going to be. Periscope can watch. Yeah. We'll Periscope all that stuff. Anybody too. still with us on Periscope? Hopefully. You're good people. So, yeah. We're, we're recording this on, uh, Paul's Periscope. On Periscope. Right? Yeah. 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 And I, so, I'm, I'm eager to see, you know, I want to try it out. Maybe start doing some with the I'm, I Am Salt Lake podcast. I'm pretty, pretty active on social media. All my social media platforms are at the Paul Dwayne. So that, that's great. But, you know, Instagram, Periscope, Twitter, Facebook. So, and I'll put sweet. all those links on the, uh, on the show notes for yep. this, uh, episode. Anything else you want to talk about, Paul? You've been a great, uh, chat, good time sitting down, getting to, uh, know you a little bit. Uh, uh next time it'll be you. I'll have you on 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 one of my things, and we'll uh, we'll get to know Chris. Absolutely, Dude, I, want, I want to sit in on that. I don't need to be on the mic, but I want to watch. I want to be on. My I told honor. Chris if he he's like I can interview you, right? And, and, and I was Kat like, told I'm me you sound just like you. Tom Hanks, and you do. I said it's weird. <laughs> Kat totally. <laughs> Why did you first. have to say that? Because <laughs> awesome. she's had a Tom Hanks thing since <laughs> she was a little girl, <laughs> man, and you're Job fulfilling doing it. Voiceovers for like Toy Story <laughs> five, six, and seven. You know when. You know what I'm it's saying? comforting, Chris. He like, like make me feel at when, home. It's like I'm like, with like budget, a known uncle. Yeah, you know, in, in the franchise to get Tom Hanks on there, but they still need, you know, they still need someone that sounds like Tom Hanks. <laughs> <That's your laughs> I could step in. I'll, I'll do totally. it. For Dude, 10 you, bucks you've an got hour. the castaway. Like, like I'm going to hand you like a volleyball <laughs> torn up and like your little Wilson. Wilson. Dude, okay, when you come on the show, I'm going to have a list of famous Tom Hanks lines, okay? <laughs> I want you to yes, do. dude. If you just hit it, just hit it out of the park, Chris. You got this, no question. Oh man, any any what, point what, the what? camera straight at him for the Periscope I'm audience to, to enjoy the shit out of it. Now we're going gonna, deep on you, bro. Chris, you are not a great. You're not in charge right now. <laughs> Maybe we should just do radio, and I'll just tell him you are Tom Hanks for the first hour. <laughs> Could you do that? I'll do it. I'll I'll, oh, yes. I'll visit okay. podcasts. Uh, Dude, just have just have your IMBD just le- just right there printed out so you don't miss a beat. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll back in the day, start, Big was I such a good time. In bosom buddies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Piece of advice or words of wisdom you want to leave with the uh, listeners from Paul Dwayne? Piece of advice. Uh, God, words man. of wisdom. Words of wisdom. I, I I think I think that people. I really believe people know the answers to most of their own questions. I really think they do. I think people are smarter and more well connected than they give themselves credit for being. I think people, I think people innately have more of a connection to the divine than any organization or any creed or any group of people would ever really want them to believe they have. I I have a lot of faith in the individual. You know, I I think that people, if they'll just get the shit out of their way, whether it be, family stuff or a substance problem or a this or a that or an insecurity. I don't know, man. I just think that I think people know what's true. I think people know what they need to do and they just, uh, if there's nothing else, I just want people to know that it's okay to, to access that and to, to be to just, it's going to be okay to like go out and do your thing and be you. And the, the, the world just needs more people just being genuinely themselves. That, that's, I just hope more people do that. That's all I want. All right, many thanks goes out to Paul Dwayne for sitting down and chatting and sharing his story. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed listening to that. I know I had a great time chatting with him. I'm going to put all the links to get in touch with him, to connect with him, to network with him. They're going to be on the show notes for this episode at imsaltlake.com slash 176. 
Let them know you heard them on the I Am Salt Lake podcast. Tell them what you thought about it. Again, the website, IamSaltLake.com, is where you can find the entire back catalog. Download those. Check them out. I've been talking to some really interesting people here in Salt Lake City. i got a brand new episode each and every week, so you're going to want to subscribe in iTunes or Stitcher Radio or however else you listen to podcasts. But listen, folks, uh, there's a few ways you can help support the podcast, help keep it moving forward. Make sure you're telling your family and friends, sharing your favorite episodes on any social media sites. Also, there is a donate button at IamSaltLake.com. That's where you can donate a few dollars. Helps keep the show alive, helps keep it moving forward, and uh, helps with the audio hosting, web hosting, new equipment, uh, all the expenses in running a podcast. Make sure to uh, donate a dollar or two, and it helps uh, helps keep the podcast moving forward. I want to thank those of you that have uh, donated in the past or uh, recently. Thank you so much. It means so much to me uh, that you guys are loving this podcast and uh, helping move in a positive direction. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. I'm here each and every week. Get out and enjoy the city. Get out and support local. And until then, you guys... uh, you guys have a great, uh, great week.